But take your Bible, turn to Revelation, follow with me there on the screen, Revelation 3.20. Um, as I said last night, 1997, God called me into studying Bible prophecy. And, um, and I learned a lot of things and, and I gave you some things to write down last night. And I missed, I missed a couple of things for you to write down. Um, and I may deal with that a little bit tonight or tomorrow night. But one of the things that I learned about the Bible that they didn't teach me in two different Bible colleges over three years. I learned that I believe that the Bible is literal in everything that it says. If the Bible says something, it means it. And what I mean by that is, in Revelation 13, we read about a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. You know what I believe? I believe the beast has seven heads and ten horns. Now, some would look at that and say, well, that's symbolic. That's metaphorical. I agree, and I understand the symbolism of it. The number seven, the number ten... The fact that they're heads, the fact that there's crowns or horns, horns represent power, horns represent forced authority. And I want you to think about that. If you've got two rams, two mountain goats uh, on the same side of the hill and they butt heads, what are they butting their heads for? What are they butting their horns at each other for? Dominion over that piece of the rock, over that side of the mountain. That's what they're doing. And so horns represent forced dominion. Uh, the Bible says God has the strength of the unicorn. And uh, the unicorn is noted for its, this one great big gigantic horn. By the way, the Bible does say, the King James does say unicorn. And it doesn't mean like these little white horse fairy rainbow unicorns that, that children believe in. At one time on this earth, there was a creature called Elasmotherium Sibiricum, I think. That was the scientific name for it. It's now extinct. But it was a humongous creature about the size of a rhinoceros. And it had one big giant horn coming out of the end of its head. They had the skeletal remains. They had the remains of the horn. And I would tell you something, if that thing got in, if you got in that thing's way, you move, not him. Amen? Because that horn will get you out of the way. So I learned to take the Bible literally for what it meant. So if I say to you what Paul said, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? I used to think, and maybe some preachers still do, that that was symbolic. That that was a metaphor, that it didn't really mean that our body was the temple of God. It's just that we're to think that it's the temple of God, but it's not really like the temple of God. Once I found out different, it changed my whole way of viewing certain things in the scripture. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. Revelation 3.20, this is the foundation of Christianity. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, we do we believe that Christ literally will come into our bodies and dwell inside of us? Do we really believe that? Amen. Absolutely. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Who's the word? Jesus Christ. So if we put Christ in our hearts. He's dwelling inside of us. Ephesians 2 19 now therefore you I, I may preach through some of this fast just because I've got a bunch of things I want to get through tonight but we're going to talk about our bodies Ephesians 2 19 now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets so there's a foundation to our life. We are built on the foundation. Jesus him, Christ himself being the chief corner stone. Remember what I taught you last night. The words. Pay attention to the words. He was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He is the chief corner stone. Not the capstone. 
like on a pyramid, like on the back of the one dollar bill. He, he literally is. He is the corner stone. And when you lay that corner stone, that corner stone basically sets the angles and the measurements for the rest of the building. Because if that first stone that you lay down is not 90 degrees this way and that way, then you're going to have a messed up building, aren't you? That corner stone that's laid down has to be tried and it has to be true. Because if the corner stone is off, even by a millimeter at, at the beginning of it, by the time you extend that wall out a hundred feet, how far off do you think you're going to be? Six inches, eight inches, ten inches, a foot, five feet? Who knows? Because if that cornerstone is not exactly perfect, then the rest of the house is messed up and it won't stand. Amen? And what, did, what does the Bible call us to do in these last days? Stand. What did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do on the day when Nebuchadnezzar told everybody to fall? What did they do? They stood. Amen. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. So anyway, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Now, here's the Bible telling you that your body or let's let's do it like this. Your own personal body or this church body, because a church, a local church is a body of Jesus Christ, is it not? Amen. And who builds that church? Christ, Christ does. Who's the, who's the cornerstone of that church? Christ is. Who's the head of that church? Christ is. Who's the foundation of that church? The apostles and prophets, which basically, that's the Old and New Testament. This is the foundation. And if the foundations are no good... And if the foundations are bad, then the building falls. Amen. So he says, an holy temple in the Lord in whom also ye are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. God wants to live in his house. Now, does God have to live inside this building? So if this building burnt down, are you still the habitation of God? Are you still the church? Are you still his body? Amen. But see, that's not what the Catholic church believes. Catholic church believes that that building is the church of God, the house of God. And if you've ever noticed a Catholic wedding, a Catholic funeral cannot be held anywhere except a Catholic church. It must be done inside that church. And they are wrong about that. Somebody say amen. In fact, they're wrong about a lot of things. Amen. amen. First Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, uh, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So what defiles the temple? Bacon? Let's hope not. Catfish? Let's hope not, because I just had catfish today. Bacon and catfish are on the list of unclean animals that, according to the law, the Jews couldn't eat. But does that defile the temple? What is it that defiles the temple? It's not what goes in the body. It's what comes out of the body. That's what defiles the temple. Because it comes out of the heart of man. And the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, the Bible says. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You have a God and you are not your own. Now let me help you with something. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of things on the internet written about the COVID virus and the COVID vaccine. There are a lot of people, and I, and I'm going to say this and I mean it in, 
in the true definition of the word, I'm not trying to be mean, there are some ignorant people on the internet who would tell you that the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast and if you take that COVID vaccine, you've doomed your soul to hell and you cannot go to heaven. That's ignorant speech. It is ignorant speech. Now, I'm not telling you to take the vaccine. I'm not telling you not to take the vaccine. And you know, I can't tell you to do that. Do you know why? Because your body does not belong to me. Your body doesn't even belong to you. Your body belongs to who? God. So when it comes to whether I should take the vaccine or not take the vaccine, let God make the decision for you. Because if God makes the decision, is it ever going to be wrong? It's never going to be wrong. Not in any way, shape or form is it ever going to be wrong. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you. See, I, one thing I believe in is the absolute providence of God. I believe God's in charge of everything. If it happened, God allowed it to happen. It was part of God's plan. What happened to Job, God allowed to happen to Job. It was part of God's plan to happen to Job. And so if God absolutely, positively, 100% does not want you to take a vaccine or a certain pharmaceutical drug or even an ibuprofen, you know what? You won't do it. And I believe it's just that simple. You are not your own. Therefore, let God make the decisions about what to do with your body. Doesn't that take the pressure off? Doesn't it make you feel better? Amen. First, First Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement at the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Revelation 3, 12. Here's an interesting verse. Now, I'm going to ask you again, how literal is the Bible? Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, did God mean that symbolically? Did God mean that metaphorically? Or did God mean that literally? Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus coming back? Yes. Is he going to rule and reign for a thousand years? Is he going to have a house that he dwells in? Say yes. This, this is, means yes in America. Okay. Is he going to have a house to dwell in? Who's going to build it? Whose builder and maker is God. What's he going to make it out of? Drywall, wood, stone, clay, paper, gold. That's exactly right. He's going to have a house, the likes of which have never been seen by human eyes. And you get to be one of the pillars in that temple. Think about it. Okay? I'm going to scramble your eggs or your brain here before I get out of here tonight. First, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. So if I lose this body, which means if I die, it's okay. I've got another one. Better one. I want you to pray for Sister Bonnie. She's a lady in our church. She is dying now of cancer. She, and she has been in severe pain the last couple of days. Very, a lot of pain. She's going to die. And her husband and I, we've been praying together that God would take her sooner rather than later because of the suffering that she's under. And he feels guilty about that. I said, don't feel guilty about that. She's got a better body than you and I put together have down here. Amen. 
We have a building of God and house not made with hands because God does not dwell in temples made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So this is, this body literally is the tabernacle of God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3. For this man was counted worthy, he's talking about Moses, of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Second Peter 1 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. He was referring to his body. First Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk. In fact, turn here. Turn in your Bible to First Peter chapter 2. I'm going to teach you something here. How many, have, how many have had somebody tell you there's mistakes in the Bible? And then they'll say, now, if, because if you look here in 1 Kings, it says, you know, like 83. And if you look here in 2 Chronicles, it says 93. Number one, who told you to go looking for mistakes in God's word? Who told you to do that? God didn't tell you to do it. I wouldn't dare call God a liar. Amen? Amen. So let me give you two simple rules. Rule number one, there are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, if someone says they found a mistake in the Bible, refer to rule number one. There are no mistakes in the Bible. Now I'm going to show you that in this verse. First, first Peter chapter two, verse two, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that we may, that you may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone. Christ is a living stone. Now, do you believe that? Amen. Then it says disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you believe that you are a stone, a rock, Amen. literally? Well, let me remind you. What are your bones made of? Calcium, Calcium is a rock. You're also made of carbon. Carbon is a rock. In your blood is iron. Iron starts out as a rock. DNA is a crystal. Crystals are rocks. This Bible's right, isn't it? Amen. You're not made of rubber, right? You're made of rocks. Amen. Lively rocks, lively stones are built up a spiritual house. So just like a house made of blocks or bricks or stone, big stones, this sister here's a stone, this brother here's a stone, this lady over here, she's a stone, the pastor over here, he's a rock, here's a rock here, and it takes the body to make the house that God dwells in. And holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be what? Confounded. So if I ask you tonight, 
Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God and it has zero mistakes in it? Could you say amen to that? Amen. Do you know why? Because to you who believe he's precious and you are not confused over the Bible issue. Amen. Now look at what it says. Uh, see, that was verse six, verse seven. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed. And I'm referring to the King James Bible. That today is the stone that is disallowed out of 99% of the churches around the world. This Bible is rejected of men. The same is made the head of the corner. And verse 8, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at what? The word, the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So the people who taught me in two different Bible colleges over three years that every Bible had a mistake in it, they were being disobedient. And I was when I believed it. But when God came to me and spoke to my heart and said, Mike, that Bible's right, I accepted it immediately without evidence, with no, no evidence whatsoever. I just believed. It's kind of like being saved. You, when God tells you to get saved, you just go down the altar and you ask Jesus in the heart and you, and you get saved. Amen. You don't argue with God. You surrender, I surrender all. The white flag comes out and you just give in. Amen. That's what I did on that day. And I didn't argue with God. But those who say there are mistakes in the Bible, especially the King James Bible, they are, they have stumbled over a stumbling stone of offense. There are stumbling stone verses in your Bible. There are verses that People who think they're smart look at it and say, see, that's a, that's a translation error. Well, that's a, that's a transmission and text error. Or that's a textual variant. Or that's not according to the original Greek and Hebrew. Or, the, or any kind of nonsense that they can come up with. They're being disobedient unto God. They stumble at the word. And those who stumble, you better watch out. Because if you stumble, you just might... What's going to happen in the last days? There shall come a falling away first. Amen. Now, the temple on earth must match the temple in heaven. For he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve into the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So God let Moses see the tabernacle in heaven. And he put that image in Moses' mind and he, and he gave him the instructions on how to make it. And he said, Moses, make it exactly the way you saw what was in heaven. And that's what Moses did. So this is an artist's rendering of what it might have looked like. There's various ways that people see it, but this is just a general generalized idea of what the tabernacle of God look like. You have the, the, um, the tabernacle wall around here. Right here is the altar where the sacrifices were burnt. And what did they sacrifice? Did they bring rocks and sand in to be burnt? Bulls and goats. Bulls and goats and fine flour and oil. They brought those in. As the sacrifices, things you can eat. Because the Levites had their living from those sacrifices. They were given a portion uh, out of those sacrifices. Here's the labor. This is where they washed. This is the sanctuary, the holy place. Right up here would be the um, table of shoe bread with 12 fresh baked loaves of bread. Here would be the candlestick. The seven golden candlesticks, which are the seven spirits of God. And then back here would be the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. There would be a curtain here and there would be right here uh, an altar of incense, which represented the prayers of the saints. So I want you to take a look at this. Now take a look at this. 
And what you're seeing here is this and this are exactly identical. Every cell in your body. How is your body made? Your liver, your heart, your lungs, your brain, your skin, your teeth, your tongue, your hair, your toenails, everything, your bones, everything in your body is made up of tiny stones like bricks that we call cells. It sort of looks like, let's see here, it sort of looks like that, which looks like that. Does that make sense? That's how your body's built. Okay? So ye is lively stone. See, this Bible's not kidding, is it? And it takes all of us, doesn't it? Is, is one stone more important than the other, aside from the cornerstone? They're all important. It takes everybody, doesn't it? That's why your pastor worries so much about you when he don't see you here. He's worried. We got a stone missing. We need a, we need a stone put back in that place. Amen? Amen? Now, let me go back here. So that here. Now watch this. Let's see here if I can do this again. Here's the tabernacle curtain, which is the cell wall or cell membrane. This is called the mitochondria. In fact, let me see. Yeah, let me do this. Let me do it like this. Here's the cell wall, which is the curtain. This is the mitochondria of the cell. The mitochondria does one thing. It burns food. Just like the altar here. It burns food. And when you burn an ox or a goat or a lamb, what comes out of that fire? Heat. Energy. So the mitochondria is the energy producer of the cell. It's when you have low blood sugar and you're out working and you need a quick hit of sugar so you can get your muscles boosted you eat a whole box of Twinkies it's healthy okay you're helping yourself just think of it that way so I'm energizing myself amen for then that sugar goes right to the cell right to the mitochondria and it burns it and it gives off heat and light light here's the cell nucleus here is the cell nucleus right here because inside the most holy place was a copy of the book that Moses wrote called the law inside the nucleus of the cell is a copy of of a book that God wrote called deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. And it's the law of your body. It's the reason why some of you are tall, some of you are short. It's the reason why some of you still have your hair and some of you still don't and never will. It's the reason why some people are black, some people are white, some people are brown, some people are yellow, some people are red. It's the reason why we have five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot. It's the reason why I still have my teeth. Okay. It's the reason, it is the law that directs everything that goes on in my body. Does my brain have to tell my body how to work, how to grow, how to make new tissues, how to make new cells? No. You know what tells my body to make new cells? The DNA does. The book. Brother, what's in charge of this church? Is it you? It better be this book. 
If this book is in charge, then this book will decide what this church needs and what it doesn't need. Because the church is a body and the body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to who? The Lord. It's the, I, God taught me with a rod several times years ago that it's God's job to decide how many people come and sit in the pews and how many don't sit in the pews. That's God's job. That's determined by the book, by the DNA. Okay? Isn't that neat? Amen. Are you literally the tabernacle of God? Every cell in your body is a tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. Hey. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, which is why you have temperature. Because those cells are burning what you had for supper. The body converts it to sugar. Let me tell you how I figured some of this stuff out. Several years ago, I found out I had diabetes. My dad had diabetes. He was a brittle diabetic. He had to take shots two or three times a day. I didn't have to take shots. I took metformin and uh, did okay with it. But here's what I found out. That when I eat something, my body converts everything that I eat into sugar. And the liver puts that sugar into my bloodstream. To, to be taken where to whatever cell needs that sugar to burn for its energy. Does that make sense so far? Now, at the entrance to the tabernacle, there were priests standing there. And those priests had one job only, and that was to determine... What was trying to get into the tabernacle actually belonged and had a right to get into the tabernacle. So if you brought a sacrifice to the priest and it had sores all over it, mucus coming out of its nose and mouth, and it was frothing at the mouth and had one eye hanging out. And you try to bring that for a sacrifice and the priest says, what are you nuts? But he says it in Hebrew, so it sounds better. Okay. And he says, we're not eating that. You take that back. So it can't get into the cell, the tabernacle, to be burnt on the altar. But if it's a good sacrifice, then the priest brings it inside the cell wall, the curtain, into the courtyard of the tabernacle. And it's blessed, and then in whatever law prescribed, and then it's placed on the altar, and it's burnt. And then the priests, the Levites, they got a portion of that and they took it home to feed their family. And that's, and that's how it was. So when I sort of saw that picture in my body, the reason why I had diabetes was I either didn't have enough Levite priests or they were lazy. Because the sugar could not get into the cell. What happens with a lot of people who have bad diabetes? What's the first thing to go on them? Their eyes. Do you know why? Because the sugar is trying to get into those cells and the Levite priests aren't there, which is the insulin. The insulin is not there to put it into the cells. And so it just starts pounding on the cells trying to get in and it can't get in. And with that pounding, it does damage to the cells. And their eyes go bad, their heart deteriorates, and all kinds of bad things happen to them. Isn't that amazing? Amen, Amen to that. Now... Uh, let's do this. Turn to Revelation 4. Some of this stuff I just don't have. I've got another whole nother presentation to show you tonight on DNA. So I'm kind of skipping over some of this stuff. But turn to Revelation chapter 4. God let me preach this out in Kenya. 
We went to a city called Magori, Kenya, which is western Kenya. And from there we went about eight miles out into the countryside. And people walked for miles to come to the meeting there. They wanted to hear the preachers from America. And there was probably a hundred or so Kenyans there. And the devil had been beating on me for days trying to talk me out of preaching. And the first sermon I preached to those people out there was what I'm going to show you tonight. And buddy, let me tell you something. When, when they heard what I showed them, they shouted, they danced, they wept, they came and knelt before God and prayed. And I'm going to show you why they did in a minute. Revelation chapter 4. Let me, um, I'll show you that in a minute. Hang on here. All right. Revelation chapter 4, after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. You know what the NIV says right here where it says one sat on the throne? You know what the NIV says there? Someone was sitting on it. That's just stupid. It's like John didn't know. Oh, I wonder who that is. Someone. And he that. So there's a throne. In the house of God, in the tabernacle of God, there is a throne. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was carried by how many priests? Four. Remember what I told you last night, the number four represented Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And, and can the Ark of the Covenant be carried any other way than that? No. What happened to David when he tried? Uzzah died. Remember that? You know what God's telling us? Don't do it another way. It'll bring death. So the only way to be saved is by what is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels, the good news of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. So the Ark of the Covenant is the throne of God. The throne of God in us is our heart. Let's see, where's, where's our heart? Here it is. And the heart has... One, two, three, four chambers in it, which match the four Levite priests, which match the four living creatures that John saw and that Ezekiel saw that carried the throne of God. The four chambers are the four living creatures or the four angels that carried, and they are the gospel of Jesus Christ. The heart gives life to the body. Without the heart, there's no blood. Without the blood, there is no life. Amen? Amen. So then, John said, uh, let's look in verse 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. What surrounds your four-chamber heart is a sack of water called the pericardium. It is the sea of glass, clear as crystal, that surrounds the throne of God in your heart. Somebody get happy and say amen. amen. And then he said in verse 5, out of the throne, what's the throne? Your heart preceded lightnings and thunderings and voices. You ever listen to your heartbeat? What does it sound like? Thunder. Do you know what causes your heart to beat? Lightning. Electricity. Amen. Amen. And then, I'm not to the good part yet. Watch this. Then he said, 
Revelation 4 verse 5, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thundings and voices. There's your voice box. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. The word spirit, what does that mean? It means breath, air. The Greek word is pneuma. Have you ever had pneumonia? It means it's a disease of the lungs, the air, the breath. Have you ever used pneumatic tools? What are they? How are they driven? By air. So the two lungs are the seven spirits of God. Why do you have two lungs? Because the Holy Ghost breathes both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Amen. Amen. So it doesn't matter what part of the Bible you're reading. Read it. All scripture is given by. See the word spira in there. Inspiration. That means when you read this book, God. Breathes in your soul the breath of life. No, oh, you're going to like this. The seven spirits of God. You say, Mike, where's the seven? Where's the seven at? Let me show you. This is your two lungs. One represents the Old Testament. One represents the New Testament. Now, if I turn it upside down, this is what's called your brachial tree. And if I turn it upside down, what does that look like? A tree and the candlestick was made like a tree because it had flowers and buds and knobs on it from an almond tree with seven branches on it and incidentally your brachial tree has one two three four five six seven branches on it just like the one in the tabernacle of God Mm -mm 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 -mm. Looks just like a tree, doesn't it? In fact, I want you to think about it. When we breathe in, what do we breathe in? Oxygen. What do we blow out? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. When trees breathe in, what do they take in? What do they blow out? That's cooler than cool, Brandon. That's true. It is the tree of life. So quit doing this to him. Amen. Amen. Mm. Even the um, the alveoli. That's how you pronounce it, I guess. On the end, looks like fruit hanging on a tree. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Oh, I'm not done yet. Hang on. That's a person getting saved. Hang on. Because when that baby's born, what's the first thing that happens? Breathe. So don't tell me you get saved one day and then six, eight months later you get the Holy Ghost. Because babies don't live for eight months without taking that first. And it's a rushing mighty wind, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Now. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. You have 12 ribs on this side and 12 on this side. How many does that make? 24. Those, and they surround the throne of God, don't they? Just like the 24 elders. Are you the temple of God? Temple. Don't you believe that now? Amen. That you are the living temple of God Himself. He even made your body... To match his house 
in heaven. That's why those Kenyans shouted. I told him, I said, you know, the world may not think much of the black man here in Africa. But God built your body to be the living and dwelling place of almighty God. Amen. So don't worry about what the world thinks about you. God made you to be his house. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, let's go home. No. Remember last night we were talking about the book, Son of Man, 196 times, 49 times 4. Jesus Christ, 49 times 4, 196 times. Book, 196 times, 49 times 4. 7 times 7 times 4. So let's learn something else about the book that God wrote. Remember, God is not the author of confusion. Jesus is the author and of our, of our faith. And faith comes by hearing, hearing by... So if there's no word, there's no faith. Okay? This book is... This book is absolutely even more essential to the life of a church than the offering is. And by the way, I, I call it like this because I pastor Bethel Church. I don't want anybody in my church being on the Bethel Bible Welfare Program, which means that I do all the Bible reading and they come once a week and hear it. That means you go home and you read your own Bible. That way, when you come back next Sunday, you're ready for church. Amen. Amen. Turn to Psalm 139. Now, what I'm going to show you tonight, David wrote the book of Psalms. We know that Solomon lived a thousand years before Christ. So David lived about a thousand forty years before Christ. So about three thousand years ago. Everything that we know about DNA is about 60 years old. That's it. Most of what we know about DNA is about 20, 25 years old. And most of that knowledge is about a day old. They're finding so much now about DNA and how it works and what all they can do with it and how they can connect a human DNA to a pig DNA, which is an abomination. Okay? But we're learning that now. We've, we've broken the code of DNA. When scientists were pondering DNA, they thought it would be just random jumblings of different codes here and there and different things. Actually, when they learned how to read it like a book, they recognized just how much in order the DNA was. It astounded them. They were not accustomed to thinking of nature building something so perfect and such order as DNA. Because most scientists, they don't believe in God. So to them, DNA is a book that wrote itself. So according to that theory, who, who remember, who still has a typewriter? You're saying I'm old, Brandon. Okay. I, I took my, my youngest son, I took him to an antique store and they had one of them old typewriters manual and I said Caleb look at that and he said what is that I said that's a text message device can you imagine somebody 60 years ago getting pulled over for texting while they were driving 
The equivalent would be to take a typewriter and three billion pieces of paper, put it out in the field, and expect that in 150 million years, it would write a book by itself. That's what you have to believe. If you're going to believe in evolution, that's what you have to believe. That a typewriter and three billion pieces of paper in 150 million years will write its own book. Okay? Now, obviously, what's the first thing wrong with that whole idea? After the first year, what happens to the paper and the typewriter out in the field? It'll degrade. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. Everything in this world does not get better. It corrupts. It breaks down, not builds up by itself. Okay? Every stitch of clothing that you've ever worn, every watch that you've ever put on, every pair of glasses that you've ever looked through, and every television set and house that you've lived in was built by somebody with intelligence to do it. But for some reason, they don't want to acknowledge that DNA had to be written by somebody. David said this, Psalm 139, 16. I want you to open your Bibles to this passage and underline this, underline this passage and write DNA. Because that's what it describes. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, this is David talking to God because he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made in, in two verses above this. He said, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now let me show you what that means. First part is, in thy book, all my members were written. So, in my DNA, my DNA wrote... That I'm going to have five fingers on each hand, a thumb. They're going to be opposite one another. My fingers were going to have three section, sections apiece. My thumb was going to have two. Um, there was going to be 27 bones in each hand. And that's just the hand. And that, that, that occurred the moment... That I was conceived in my mother's womb. The moment I was conceived in my mother's womb, the two parts of my dad and my mom's DNA came together and they wrote out everything that you're looking at here tonight. That was 55 years ago. 55 and a half years ago. Okay? So your fingers, your ugly elbows, and your elbows are ugly. No guy ever looks at a girl and says, boy, look at those elbows. <laughs> Woo. And if you notice the skin on your elbow is thicker than the skin right under your arm. You ever notice that? Why is that? Because your elbow, yeah, it's a forklift. That was funny, wasn't it? Yeah. Your armpits, your lips, your toes, your eyes, your blood, all the hormones in your body, uh, your, your, your bones, your, your skeleton, your skin, how tall you are, how short you are, what color you are, everything, everything the exact moment of conception, everything was written out. So what you could say is that DNA is not just a book written, it's a book of prophecy. Because it prophesies what is going to happen, doesn't it? 
So yeah, on the, on the day you were conceived, you didn't have hands and fingers and a heart and hair and head and everything. That didn't happen that day. But it did happen over time. Some of you at age 11, 12, 13, you hit puberty. Well, puberty was written into your DNA the moment you were conceived. But that prophecy didn't come to pass when you were three. Thank God. Or five or even eight. It came to pass at a certain exact time, didn't it? Okay. And then, you know, some of us guys that are losing a little bit up here. I used to have thick stuff up here. Shag carpeting. Okay. But at some point, my head started letting some of it go. That also was written in my DNA. Okay. It's a book of prophecy. And then... Written into every cell in my body is a thing called programmed cell death. It's the reason why cancer cells just keep growing and building huge masses. Because one of the things about cancer cells is the cancer itself the, is, is an alteration of the DNA of the cell. And one of the things that it alters is that it turns off Programmed cell death. Because it is appointed unto man once to die. And God has programmed this body to die. One way or the other, it's going to die, isn't it? And that's something. Then, so look at it like this. In thy book, DNA... All my members, think of a family, all my, here we, here we go, all my members were written, so dad, mom, not dad and dad, dad and mom, and the children look like dad and mom, in thy book, all my members of my family were written, which in continuance was fashioned when as yet there were none of them. So on day one of conception, all I was was just a cell, one cell. And then I was two cells, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and then 32, and then 64, and 128, and then 256. And then it started growing. And after a while then, some of the cells started changing a little bit, and they started twitching. And some of those cells that were twitching made more cells that were twitching, and pretty soon I had a four-chamber heart in my body. All written by and directed by a book. Wow. That's good. Did not Paul say, for the word of God is quick? What does the word quick mean? Alive. Alive. The book of DNA is alive because it knows how to make the parts of my body that my body needs. If my body needs more insulin, there is a recipe in my DNA on how to make insulin and my DNA directs how to make the insulin, instructs the part of my body that makes the insulin to make the insulin and then the insulin is made and used in my body. And it's all directed by the book. The book is alive. Amen. Amen. See, too many churches are making the churches about the person in the pulpit. But it's not about the person in the pulpit because he can't do anything. The book does it. Amen. 
So it's called deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. It's packaged in 46 chromosomes. Chromo. Does anybody know what that word means? Chromo. No, it doesn't mean gay. <laughs> they called them chromosomes because they noticed early on when they were looking through their microscopes that DNA or the, the chromosomes responded well to the dye that they would put in that would help them see it because it reacted to the dye and was colorful. When Ezekiel saw the throne of God, what did he see over the top of the throne of God? A rainbow. When John saw it, he saw the rainbow. He saw the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. The colors of it. And by the way, how many colors are in a rainbow? And isn't that something that you take seven different colors and when you put them all together, you get white. Wow. Okay. So watch this. It doesn't matter what color you are. Amen. Because when Christ brings us all together. Huh? White as snow. Hmm. And they're placed inside the cell nucleus. Here's what we know about DNA. It's rolled up in a helix form. Twisted, crooked. Has two spines made of sugar and phosphorus. They're linked together by four bases. Bonded by hydrogen. Now these four bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. There's to be a test after the deal tonight. So remember that, okay? But we remember what the number four means. So now watch this. Watch this. Look up on the screen. See that DNA? By the way, what does it look like right now? Can you think of a story in the Bible? I didn't say say it out loud. I said think of it. Well, you guys don't listen. No, that's okay. Guess who that ladder was? You see, the, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And in the book of John, he told Philip, And hereafter you shall see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Because our ladder to heaven is who? It's Jesus Christ. Now, think about this for a second. You have... A spine here, or like a ladder leg here, and a ladder leg here. And you have four bases that join them together. Here is the Old Testament. Here is the New Testament. And here are the four books that join the Old Testament and New Testament together. Just like DNA, called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see, the book that God wrote here matches exactly the book that God wrote there. That's cool. And where is, okay, so and you don't know this yet, but the adenine, the guanine, the cytosine, and thymine, they're joined together, and the way they're joined together, it makes sort of like a Morse code, like that. Does anybody learn Morse code? Like when you were in the army, you learned Morse code? Da, 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 da. What is that? That's SOS. Okay. So what happens is adenine joins to thymine and only connects to thymine. Adenine cannot connect to guanine and cytosine. Cytosine, C, can only connect to guanine but cannot connect to adenine and thymine. Okay, so if I have an, a one strand of the DNA and there's adenine here, what must there be here? Thymine. Okay, and that's, and that's how the genetic code is made. So the scientists that are looking at this, if they see adenine, guanine, guanine, they know what amino acid that makes they know what 
let's say they know what letter that is. Let's say adenine, guanine, guanine is the letter B. They know what that is. They know how to read it. And then cytosine, cytosine, and cytosine. Those three together, let's say that's the letter L. They know what that is. So as they're looking at the base pairs, and that's what they're called, four base pairs. When they're looking at them, they see three of them. They know that those three, that makes the letter B. The next three makes the letter I. The next three make the letter B. The next three make the letter L. And the next three make the letter E. So you have the word Bible. That's how they read the genetic code of every DNA, of every species on the planet. If it's alive, it has DNA. And that's how they can read it because it's written just like the letters in a book and it even has periods and paragraph markers built into it. There's a thing called stop DNA and start DNA and it's a sequence of the base pairs that tells it this gene is done and now a new gene is being spelled out underneath it. And then when they see the stop DNA, they know that this gene marker is, is complete and they know another set of genes is being written out. And genes are what makes the parts of our body. Genes are words. Amino acids are letters. So, um, so the, when three of them join together, it makes an amino acid like the letter R. Or the letter B. Now, the number of amino acids that the combinations make is 22. In other words, there's 22 letters that your DNA uses to make the words that make the parts of your body. The Hebrew language has exactly 22 letters in it which is what the Old Testament was written in. You can find that in Psalm 119. Who wrote DNA? God did. And he wrote it in Hebrew. Just like in the Bible. Somebody say amen. amen. So, Psalm 119, 156. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. Thy judgments is a reference to the book. Quicken me means make me alive. So what makes me alive? My DNA, which are the book or the judgments of God. But DNA, we said it's a ladder, but in its normal state, it's twisted or crooked. Okay? So, and remember that these two the two uh, legs of the ladder are made of sugar and phosphorus. What is phosphorus? If you dip a bullet in phosphorus and fire it, what happens? Does anybody know? You got a tracer round. When you shoot it at night, you can see where the bullet's going because it lights up. Phosphorus is light. So not only did God write the book of DNA, he wrote it in light. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Because the rungs are made of sugar. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. It's because it's made of phosphorus and sugar, which makes it sweet to the taste and gives it light. You have the light of God inside of you in your DNA. Amen. Amen. Ezekiel, when I would look, behold, a hand was said unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he said, when he ate it, it was as honey for sweetness. It was a rolled up book, just like DNA, and he ate it, and it tasted sweet, just like DNA. John did the same thing in Revelation 10. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We talked about the two rungs being the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, let me move through some of this here. Okay. 
Take your Bible, turn to Revelation 22. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 100 years ago, these verses that we're going to read, we didn't really understand how important they were. We as non-Catholics, in other words, the people who believed sola scriptura, only the Bible, we knew not to add anything or take anything away from God's word. We knew that the Pope could not just inject his own doctrine and make everybody believe it for salvation. Amen? So, in the last book of the Bible, last occurrence of the word book as well, Revelation twenty two eighteen. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So there's two rules that God has, not just for the Bible... But for DNA, now that we understand that DNA is the book, just like what you have in your hand, there are two rules. Don't let anybody add any words to your DNA. Don't let anybody take away any of the words of your DNA. Can they do that now? Yes. CRISPR technology. Let me explain a little bit about how CRISPR works. They actually figured out that it's a, a um, so what was it, a bacteria that could do this. They use a bacteria and the bacteria goes into your body and they program the bacteria to find a certain gene in your body. So let's say, um, let's say that you had a gene in your, in your body that gave you a certain disease. The doctors now know that if they can remove that gene or turn it off, then you will no longer have that disease. So what they'll do is they'll program the CRISPR agent, put it into your body. It will look at all of your DNA and find that one gene and cut it out and remove it and then stitch your DNA back together, taking out words. Now, you have that disease in your body and who wrote it in there? God did. Now, why did God do that to him? Maybe God doesn't like him. But he put it in there for a reason. Amen? And if... I wrote a book and I'm making a million dollars on it and you come along and take words out of my book and then resell it as your own. Can I sue you? Oh, yeah. yeah. So you can't do that. God is the one who wrote the book. Whatever is in there, God put it in there for a reason. And he'll either take it away if he wants, or he'll give you the grace to live with it. Amen? Amen. So they're saying now we can cure this disease, we can cure that disease, we can cure this disease. The doctors in China, this baby that was going to be born had a disease. They went in before the child was even born and rewrote that child's DNA to take away whatever disease it had, and it was called the CRISPR baby. is the world's first child that we know of that was born genetically altered from birth. And that 
Alteration, by the way, is permanent. Permanent. Meaning it cannot be undone. Don't let them change your DNA. Somebody say amen. amen. So these chromosomes. Well, I tell you what, you guys are getting a little sleepy eye on me. So I'm going to move through some of this. Watch this. Let's take this theme now, Psalm 139, 16, and apply it to this church. In thy book. All my members were written. Now, do we believe that if your name is on a church roll, that you automatically go to heaven? We don't, know, we don't believe that, do we? Some churches do. They give you a catechism. You say the catechism. You say all the right words. They put your name on the membership list. You're going to heaven as far as they're concerned. But that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't matter if your name is written in the book of the church. Is your name written in the book of? That's what DNA is. It's a book of life, isn't it? So in thy book, if you want to be a member of this church or my church, first thing I'm going to ask you is, are you born again? Is your name written in the book of life? Now, on the day of Pentecost, was we call it the beginning of the church, there wasn't very many people there on the day of Pentecost, 120. But by the end of the day, how many, how many, how many members did the book make by the end of the day? 3,000. And what made those members? The book did. Amen. Peter got up and preached the book. And they said, what must we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. 3,000 people got saved that day. Why? Because the book. So in thy book, all my members were written. So is your name in the book of life? If your name is in the book of life, say amen, raise your hand, shout hallelujah, do whatever you got to do. Amen. Did, and how long has your name been in that book? According to the scripture from the foundation of the world. That's because God knew. Remember, DNA is a book of prophecy. Oh, that's good. And it makes members when it's time. Amen. All my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned. This church had been here how long? Seventy-five years? Well, man, I didn't mean to cause church split, just asking how old the church was. I was not a family member. Let's say it's been let's say the let's say the church itself, not the building, the church itself, let's say the church itself is seventy years. Seventy years ago there were members who were saved in this church. Who aren't here anymore. But the people who are here now. Who are saved. God had you born at a certain time. Saved at a certain time. To be part of this church at this time. For such a time as this. I like it when people know scripture. When as yet. There was none of them. God already knew. Who is going to be in his church, his body. Amen. Because he wrote them in there. That's right. mm. Mm, 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 mm. Jesus said, I am the, ye are the. Mm. Just like a grapevine. I'm the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean through the what? 
the word. You see, the branches receive from the root the DNA and the water and the nutrients from the ground. So that when the grapes came, come out, the grapes contain what in the core of them? What do grapes have in the middle of them? Seeds. seeds. What, what are seeds? What's in those seeds? DNA. DNA. So when those seeds are planted somewhere else, what do you make? Another vine with more branches. It's just like going out, sharing the gospel with somebody. They get saved. They grow. And then they go tell somebody else about the gospel. They get saved. They grow. They go tell somebody else about the gospel. They get saved. See how it's been working now? For two, It's been working, hasn't it? We don't need purpose-driven church. We don't need a rock and roll band. We don't need light shows. We don't need fog machines. We don't need all that junk that all these other churches have. We just need to open up the book. And he said, now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Did you hear that? Except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, who believes that? Amen. Don't let the charismatics and the goofs on TBN scare you out of believing what God said. Because if you are in this book, that means the way you think is in line with the way God thinks. And you won't ask for anything that's stupid or out of God's will. You'll be asking for things that promote God, that, are, that seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's the things you'll ask for. And God, of course, will give them to you. Mm. Remember what I said. If it's adenine here, it must be thymine. If it's guanine here, it must be cytosine. So let me tell you, let me teach you a little bit, very, very quickly and easily, about how DNA makes stuff in your body. Okay? So let's say, let's say that, um, well, let's, let's use the example of insulin. Okay? Now, what food contains insulin? There is none. Your body, has to make it. Your body has to make it. There's no insulin in oranges. There's no insulin in apples. There's no insulin in milk. There's no insulin in fried chicken and catfish. So your body has to build it. It has to make it from scratch like your granny used to. Granny didn't buy Wapam on the counter biscuits. <laughs> granny made hand squished biscuits. Amen? Amen. And weren't those better? Hand squashed is better than whop them. Right. Amen. And granny knew how to make them. Because granny had a recipe from her mama who got a recipe from her mama passed down through the ages. And this is how DNA works. So let's say that my body needs insulin and my body doesn't have, didn't eat something with insulin in it and store it in a pouch somewhere. It has to make it from scratch. So now watch this. This works in a church too. When your pastor preaches a message, it's probably because God has laid a certain issue on his heart. And when he gets up to preach to you, he doesn't say, now let's start Genesis and go all through the Revelation and I'm going to preach all the whole Bible this morning. It'll take us till Friday afternoon. He doesn't do that. What God does is God knows the needs of the church. God will then direct the needs of the church to the shepherd. And the shepherd then will take what he knows out of the scripture, take certain verses of scripture, put them together, stand before you, preach it to you. The word is going into you and it's doing exactly what God wants it to do to fulfill the need that God knows is needed in this church. Amen. 
Sound right? That's exactly how it works in your body. So when your body needs insulin or when it needs like a hormone or when it needs more blood cells or when it needs to make more sweat or anything like that, here's what happens. That there's a, there's a machine called, uh, I had it up here a while ago, topoisomerase, topoisomerase. Its job is to scan your DNA and read it and find the place in the DNA that has the recipe for making insulin. Now, remember, last night we read where they handed Jesus the book, right? And the book was the book of Isaiah, which has 66 chapters, and your Bible has 66 books in it. So they were handing Jesus like a, a copy of the book. And Jesus didn't just randomly open to any old place. He went to a specific place in Isaiah because he knew that what he was going to say was going to be fulfilled right then and there. Does that make sense to everybody? So the, the little machine goes through and it reads your DNA. When it finds the place where it is going to make, it has the recipe for insulin, it stops. It breaks the hydrogen bonds and un, unrolls the book. And it breaks the seals. Who has the right to break the seals? Jesus. So, yeah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he breaks the seal. So a piece, one strand of that DNA comes loose. Just one strand of it, not both of them, just one. Because the rules are, if it's adenine here, it's thymine here. So then the, the machine will read that piece of DNA and make a copy of it. And that copy is called messenger RNA. The word angelos in Greek for the word angel means messenger. Jesus Christ is the messenger of the covenant. When you hand out Bible tracts, do you hand people a whole Bible and say, now read this cover to cover and you'll be saved. You hand them a Bible tract with just the verses that will hopefully lead them to Jesus Christ. Right? Amen. And that's, that's, what, that's what DNA does. It, and it makes a copy called messenger RNA. Then it takes that messenger RNA and it reads it. And as it reads it, it starts grabbing proteins out of your body and putting them together. And then it starts folding them in a certain way because the instructions say, now fold it this way and fold it this way and do this with it and do this with it. And by the time it gets to the end, it's created an insulin molecule. And however much insulin you need, it'll repeat that process until it's made enough insulin for you to, to make, to take care of your needs. That's exactly how it happens. That's cool. And let's say somebody came to you, sister, one of your kids, one of your grandkids, or one of your neighbors, and they're having a problem. And you know that problem because you've been through it before in your life, and God showed you in his word how to get through that. And she comes to you and says, I, I don't know what to do. I know you go to church and... And I'm just having this problem here and it's, it's related to my marriage and it's, but it's a mess and I don't know what to do. And you're going to take your Bible and you're going to open up to a certain place in it. And you're going to read verses to her that she needs. You're not going to read to her about giants. You're not going to read to her about the flood. She needs to hear something. And you're going to read to her the verses that she needs. And it's going to fill a need in her life. You're now the messenger RNA. Isn't that something? You see, each one of you that believes this book has a responsibility to find the needs in other people's lives when they come to you. When they come to you. Don't be a busybody in everybody's affairs. But when they come to you and then you give them pieces of this book, now you're an angel. You're a messenger of the covenant. Amen. Amen. So now, 
If you ever, uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Jesus said this. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, Matthew, Jesus said that in Matthew 24. That's New Testament. So if you wanted to know what Jesus meant by that, what would you do? Go back to Genesis 6 and 7 and read about the days of Noah. And see, this is how it works. Because remember, if it's adenine here, it must be thymine. Okay? Or let's say that, let's say that um, this church wanted to build another church in a foreign country that would be sort of a satellite off of this church. And so all the preaching that's done here, you raise up a man who is from a foreign country. He goes to his country with what he's learned here. And he goes over there and he builds a church over there that's sort of modeled after this church. He's taking the same Bible and he's going over there to do it. When your cell splits and makes a new cell, all of your DNA, it slices in half and half of the strand of DNA goes to the new cell and the other half stays in the old cell. Now it needs to be joined back together again and it's easy to do because if it's adenine here, it's thymine here. And so it automatically rolls together. In Isaiah 34, 16, the Bible says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. There, for every doctrine in the New Testament, there is an Old Testament mate to that. And for everything that you read in the Old Testament, I guarantee you there's a New Testament mate to that verse or that passage or that idea in the Old Testament. Somebody say amen. amen. That's how the Bible is written. That's what Paul said when he said, you, uh, not, not the wisdom which man teaches, but the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. You want to learn the Bible, you read a little bit of New Testament one day, read a little bit of Old Testament. Read a little bit of Old Testament one day, read a little bit of New Testament. And after a while, God will start mating together these things for you, and God will give you light and understanding. And God will build a house that's just full of light. Father, bless your people. Bless your word. Father, do what only the Word can do in these people's hearts and minds. Thank you, God, Lord, for being here tonight in the form of your Word and your Holy Spirit. Father, we do not believe the world. We don't believe we came from monkeys and sea fish. And we don't believe we came from evolution. Father, you created us. You made us. You, you formed us. You breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. We are your creation, Father. We thank you, God, that you've ex expanded now our faith and our trust in your word. Teach us yet, Father, great and mighty things that we know not. And bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.